Welcome to a new episode here on the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn. And today, we're going to journey to a place we have been once before, at least. And that is the sweaty, humid, hot environment of New Orleans. But our guest today is in the other hot, sweaty uncomfortable environment which is atlanta georgia former stomping ground of myself when i was in macon so i know her area somewhat and we are gonna talk today with maria montalvo she is an assistant professor of history at emory she got a PhD from Rice University, and we are going to chat today about a extraordinarily interesting book. I, I was very impressed by the style of the book, and that is Enslaved Archives, Slavery, Law, and the Production of the Past, published by Johns Hopkins University Press came out oh july 2024 i thought it was actually a few weeks earlier <laughs> it's fresh off the press like it's a month ago so first of all congratulations to bring out the book and thank you for taking the time today maria to talk with me so let's start with the origin stories i always look forward to kind of hearing how how the book comes about because sometimes there's these curious moments of how you get to it. So tell us, how, how did Enslaved Archive come about? What What's the, what's the origin story? Sure. Um, I was joking with a friend when I saw your talking points that you had origin story at the very top, and I just said a lot of crying, I think. <laughs> I can um, see that. Yeah. But um, I guess the project starts in graduate school, and um, I didn't set out to become a history historian of slavery. I thought I was going to be a historian of medicine. Oh. Uh, I was interested in the history of mental illness in the 19th mm. century US. Uh, and that's where I thought I was going. But I was surrounded by a lot of very good historians of slavery, like Jim Sidbury, like Caleb McDaniel, and like David Andrew Johnson, whose first book comes out in September. And uh, so I sort of got pulled into that direction a little bit. And one day my advisor sent me um, a screenshot of, I can't remember whose book it was, but it's either Ariella Gross's Double Character or Judith Keller Schaefer's Slavery Civil Law in the Louisiana Supreme Court. And it was a, a, a snippet uh, describing a lawsuit where a, a person who bought an enslaved person was suing the seller mm -hmm. because they sold them someone who was insane. Um, and that pulled me into those oh. sources and, and into that literature and um, got me uh, started on a path to being very familiar with these redhibition lawsuits that centered on enslaved people. Huh. And the project sort of begins there, and uh, it took a lot of twists and turns to get it to where it was. But I'll just stop rambling there. So. <laughs> no, that that is fascinating of how you like that that one image all of a sudden starts you down the path for the book. Um, no, crazy. Did you have a thing now? That story didn't make it into the book, did it? No, no, it oh. didn't. There's um. <laughs> There are a lot of stories that didn't make it in, like deciding that each chapter was going to be about one person. Mm -hmm. kind of you do a lot of cutting. There's a lot of stuff that got left on the cutting room floor, for sure. Like, well, yeah, we all have that, unfortunately, right? Of like the hundreds of pages our editors say, nope, 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 cut, <laughs> cut, cut. cut. Oh, yeah. Heart bleeds every time. Um, But in, in part, I'm glad you're kind of already mention some of the book here and kind of things that got left out because and there, there there's so much I want to talk about with your book because it's so fascinating but I, I really want to talk first about 
your your decisions in structuring, organizing, and writing is a bug because what 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 drew me in was first of all that the personalization, right? That each chapter has a person at its center, but then also how you somewhat frame this almost like a detective story, right? That you were searching, you were looking, and you brought yourself into the writing. So was that a conscious decision? Was that sort of your editor like saying, well, this would be a good way to do it? Was there pushback from your editor about that? Reviewers, like, how, how did you go about it? Yeah, um, I guess it's it, it first started to look the way it does now when I was writing the dissertation. And at first, uh, I sort of did write it in the style of Ariella Gross and Judith Schaefer, where I was taking tidbits from all these different stories and mm -hmm. sort of putting them together. Um, but then in 2016, I read Marisa Fuentes' book, Dispossessed Lives. Mm -hmm. And that sort of gave me permission, it felt like, to narrow in on mm -hmm. specific people yeah. um, and I sort of came to the conclusion that because I was interested in these um, deliberate strategies when it came to historicizing a person mm -hmm. that it would be most that making that clear would be a lot easier at the level of an individual mm -hmm. um, right. and because I'm so committed to trying to tell a story I felt like taking the reader through that journey with me mm -hmm. uh, would be an important part of the process mm -hmm. uh, of not just showing my hand but showing you how I got there mm -hmm. so. yeah no. no that's great <laughs> it, it, it's a very nice approach and it, it it invests you as a reader very much in in those in the lives of these people which is makes it easier to connect in in all in in all of it and so let me go with this the other point then how oh, how did you decide on the people you wanted to use because in in the in the first chapter you you mentioned that you you have the guy John as the kind of center but you said that was actually not initially the first person you wanted to write about um i i kept the journal uh as i was writing and i've become more committed to it over the years but i wish i had been better about writing down like the moments where i made those specific decisions mm. but when it comes to john um that the chapter that's in my dissertation uh, that's about that lawsuit where John pops up momentarily. Um, I, I mentioned John in that chapter maybe five or six times and that's it. Uh, uh -huh. He's not, he's not my mm -hmm. focus at all. Yeah. Um, it was easier to tell a story and make an argument about the person who was enslaved alongside John because he was mm -hmm. the focus of the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. But um, but as I got into the writing the book phase or trying to write a book phase of the project, I, I suddenly, I, I had a moment where I realized that I'd been ignoring him, mm. um, and that I'd been ignoring people like him, uh, because, you know, over a hundred thousand people. Uh, in those notarial archives and we s encounter them the way we encounter John, a name, mm -hmm. an age, a sex, and a mm -hmm. price. Right. And we quantify and we add things together yeah. and we kind of move on. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of wanted to know what it would be like to try and tell a story about him. Right. Um, and uh, that process, uh, unfortunately, you know, doesn't yield additional biographical information about John, but 
um, I think it gets us closer to asking questions and mm -hmm. making these informed speculations mm -hmm. that get us a little bit closer to his experience and the experience of people like him, at least in mm -hmm. the context of a sale. Right. right. Um, that, which also is sort of like, I, I was going to ask, since you kind of, with John, you have like, you, you have these this very short moment, and with many of them have these very short moments that they appear and then they disappear. And you don't know what happened before. You don't know what happens to them afterwards and um, what they're thinking. And I, I kind of wonder how frustrating was that for you in the writing process? Because we want to tell these stories. We we want to know, like, is there a happy ending? Like, or is there no happy ending? Well, what happens to these individuals? So, like, how frustrating was that to you in the in the process of coming developing the book? It's definitely frustrating. Um, you want, you know, we're historians and we're invested in stories that show change over mm -hmm. time. And when you're focused on enslaved people, like you don't always get to tell stories like that. Um, mm -hmm. This is Tito. Yep. Um, and for those watching, you, for those just listening, we have a cat now in the picture. So you might actually want to watch the YouTube video instead because it's more entertaining. Um, so, yes, it, it's frustrating. Um, and um i am interested in and i had those moments of frustration mm. uh, like i did when looking at john and even looking at people who were at the center of lawsuits because you're able to tell this story about them uh and this very brief period of their life mm -hmm. and then it, it they disappear from the record mm -hmm. again and it's over um so in a way you become accustomed to the losing. Uh, right. You recognize that it's part of the job. Yeah. Oh, never the good, not a good part of the job, unfortunately, in that. So, yeah. uh, uh, you think here, <laughs> uh, I, I do lose my train of thought every once in a while too. Um, let's <clears throat> let's talk about the the sources then for a minute because obviously we're dealing with people here that are intentionally left voiceless right that we don't have their own voice we we have other people's voices or short notices in like ads or notary books so you're looking at court records and we'll we'll talk more about the the different court cases that are in, that that are involved here in a minute but what did these court records give you what were sort of the silences that were that were seeing and also sort of like was there any other biographical materials that you could locate for them like like, was there census data from, like, their enslavers that gave you little hints and glimpses, or was there just, just nothing? Uh, some of them, there's there's nothing after the lawsuit, like, yeah. for Betsy. Um, I wasn't able to find anything after that, though, um, you know, the New Orleans notarial indexes have recently been digitized and OCR mm -hmm. so you can like oh, wow. text owners who were selling enslaved people so I'm going to go back and see if I can find her because I I'm still you know interested in mm -hmm. what happens after the lawsuit's over yeah. uh, but for some that's the case that they disappear uh, and then for others um, you know like Sarah Connor like you have lawsuits on lawsuits and contracts <laughs> newspaper articles and Things like yeah, that. Yeah, we'll get to yeah. her, but it, I felt like the notaries and judges in New Orleans were like, oh, sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she would not go away. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Always get up, person. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. Okay, so that a lot of limits there, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, 
the one so final part before we get into the kind of nuts and bolts kind of what's in the book but i also found it very intriguing of how at the start say you talked about wanting to turn the narrative around right that instead of like here's the name, the date, and let's talk about their enslaver, or let's talk about what's being argued in the courtroom and what the enslaver is saying, what the judge is saying, and all that. You wanted to bring the voice of the enslaved forward. And that, A, seems really difficult because you have such a limited base to operate with, but also it's it seems like such a, like, Duh, of course we should do that moment. <laughs> Why haven't we done it? Uh, I think we don't do it because it's very difficult. Um, mm. uh, because not that the work that any historian does is easy, but um, because it's often prudent to ask, what can I learn from the source and uh, not ask the additional question of why can I learn anything from it at mm -hmm. all um you know I've I've had the opportunity to learn from historians who ask questions about historical production like mm -hmm. Caitlin Rosenthal and like Marisa Fuentes and like Jennifer Morgan um and that helped me get beyond you know summarizing what happened in court right. and asking questions about how people knew what to say when they got to the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we don't do it all the time because it's difficult. Uh, but, you know, there's historians out there who are doing that kind of work. And I'm hopeful for what we're going to see moving forward. Yeah. Are you pushing your grad students to do it this way? <laughs> oh, I don't have any grad students yet, but that's well, not Yeah. <laughs> eventually you will. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if you're a li grad student listening in, if you're going to Emory, yeah. you've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> um, curious question, like, the, would you write it differently today? Like, looking back, would you do it differently or would you do it the same way again? I was thinking about something like that earlier because uh, I'm, I'm in the process of putting together an article. And um using my data set in ways that I mm -hmm. didn't use it okay. in the book yeah. uh, because I'm so focused on individual lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't give you paragraphs of numbers and talk right. about trends. That we like, appreciate I that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just don't do it in the book. And I could have written a very different book had I wanted to go in that direction, right. but I'm happy that I did it. Uh, that's not the way I, I think those studies can be important. Uh, but that's not the way I like to write. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not the kind of book I wanted to write. So, um, you know, it's terrifying to have it out in the world, but I'm happy that I did it the way I did it. Yeah, no, it, like, it's sometimes just curious, you know, when you yeah. when you think back about like, hmm, should have done that differently or, well, that was stupid, you know. Like, yeah. But yeah, it's out there. It's like, it's done. It's over. Good. Yeah, Moving on to the that. next. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, great. So let's let's get to the the um, now I have to actually look five cases, five cases that you have in the book. Um, so each chapter is, you know, individual person that it's focused on. And I, I shouldn't say five cases since <laughs> the last chapter was Connor has <laughs> a few cases actually in it. Um, but let's start first with the actually i'm going to open it broadly for you to kind of go with both because we have if i remember now correctly we have two different legal cases types that you look at so can you run us through a little bit of like what what they are and what court cases we're we're looking at here in your book sure um i looked at a lot of lawsuits to be able to find uh the set of enslaved person-centered warranty disputes and eventually freedom suits. Um, and these warranty disputes, the way they sort of work is um, an enslaved person was sold 
and the person who bought them sues the seller mm -hmm. uh, because they supposedly after the sale discovered that the person possessed some quality or exhibited some behavior that diminishes their value or utility. So if someone was sick, uh, if someone had a mental illness, mm -hmm. if someone had committed a capital crime in the past or was in the habit of stealing or running away, those were all reasons that you could sue. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that are articulated in like the civil code, but people sued for all sorts of reasons like drunkenness, um, uh, you sold me a person and you said they had the skill and they don't have it, all mm. sorts of different reasons. Um, so those are the warranty disputes. And then you have freedom suits, which are more well known where, uh, you know, in Louisiana, at least until the mid 1850s, enslaved people could sue for their freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so those disputes make up the other uh, set of data that I work from. And the retribution cases are the warranty because yes. that's sort of like the legal legal jargons that you do have in the books there that you get used to very quickly. You're very good at that, actually with the keeping the jargon limited in Thank that. Um, it wasn't like you sometimes think legal historians are like, oh, good God. <laughs> no, there was no none of that in there, thankfully. <laughs> um, so... We, okay, so we have these instances, and the the first one we're dealing with is John. So, why do we have a suit with regard to John? Why, why, why is his new owner upset about the sale? Yeah, so John pops up in the written record because he was sold alongside an enslaved man named Jim Gall. And uh, they were purchased by uh, an Arkansas cotton planter named Thomas Gatlin from a New Orleans slave trader named Bernard Kendig. And so Gatlin buys these two people, takes them back to Arkansas and realizes it. And uh, Jim Gall pretty promptly escapes. Um, so he sues Bernard Kendig on the basis that he sold him someone who was in the habit of running away. Mm -hmm. um, so that opens this pathway to these this this enslaver like working to historicize mm -hmm. Jim Gall in court because to win a retribution suit, you had to demonstrate that this person, mm -hmm. usually you had to demonstrate that this person had a history mm -hmm. of this particular characteristic or ailment. Um, so that opens the door to this history of Jim Gall. Um, but no one in this dispute is invested in historicizing John. Uh, when he's mentioned, he's mentioned to say he was sold alongside Jim. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of it. He's gone. Uh, I, I, I know that they took him to Arkansas and then I lose him. Um, and because the book is about the losing and how and why it happens mm -hmm. it occurred to me as i was down the road into writing that uh, you know how we find and lose john in a contract is more emblematic of how we usually mm -hmm. find and lose enslaved people mm -hmm. like when you go into i don't i don't spend time in the book on things i found in archives in like north carolina or new york but when you go into planners records that the majority of what you find are acts of sale, uh, right. are right. documents that have a, na a name, an age, a sex, and a price, and then that's it. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to know why, um, why that's all that's left of John, um, and whether, you know, looking at how the John that exists in the record came to be could tell us something about his experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's how that's the kind of twisted path that led me to him no but that's that makes it an interesting story right that you you didn't pick the obvious character the one that runs away and then becomes part of the lawsuit so even though but you, 
he's sort of absent in the lawsuit because he has run away. Um, but you, you focus on the characters that didn't run away and like probably remained a slave until like I guess the Thirteenth Amendment reaches Arkansas. Oh, maybe so. You know, we have to assume, I guess. Um, but what I what I found really interesting in in that chapter too was sort of how you talked about the process of the sale, right? Of like how the trader tra coaches the sl the enslaved to kind of talk about what do you not talk about what do you say how do you say it right and then like they're even talking about how how the enslaved are actually sort of like like what we do when we go to job interviews they interview us but we interview them in the same in the same moment that uh, that was so fascinating like obviously we don't know what went through john's mind but i thought that was really brilliant to kind of think about yeah, that's, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think narrowing in on the warranty and the meaning of it mm -hmm. and how it was constructed gives us this small pathway into asking questions about John's experience mm -hmm. as the subject of a warranty. Yeah. Um, what would he have been instructed to say, not mm -hmm. to say things about himself and his past and his mm -hmm. health and his age and mm -hmm. um, where he had been and what he knew how to do. Um, because we have so much written by enslavers and, you know, people like Walter Johnson have already done the work of unpacking the process of a sale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it narrowing in on that warranty uh, gives us space to sort of speculate a little bit more. Yeah, no, and I mean that's the thing, right? We 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 don't know, but it's it it it's also that coercion that you then have, like like don't say anything bad, right? In when the in the potential enslaver, your new enslaver, talks to you because then you get punished, or like, yeah. but then also like if you kind of realize the man is a really bad person, do you want to say something bad because? Do you really want to spend the rest of your life potentially at that plantation? And it, it man, it's a doomed if you do, don't do doomed if you don't kind of moments there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, so that that was again sort of really interesting to like what what information to kind of talk about. Like it's a sales pitch. Yeah, like it, it's almost like you have an item on the store shelf, and that item has to talk to you and sell you. Why? Why should you buy it? And it's just so, so perverted. Yeah, having to perform that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to Isaac Wrights and as the the second one of your your characters, and he he was. I'm not even sure how to phrase this because it just that was just so sick. Like what like I'm gonna ask you since what since there is some speculation, when when do you think that that first mate made the decision that he's gonna try and sell these guys? Yeah. Is it when the captain goes sick and off 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 boat, or is it already on the journey that he probably made that choice? I think the captain was in on it too. Okay. Um, so they probably decided when they were hired that that was something they were going to do. Mm. Uh, uh, it's possible okay. they'd done it before. Like maybe yeah. there's other people they'd made disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it's it's hard to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's important to know that it's three individuals, right? Right yes. is right is only one. That what happened to the other two? Were they able to get their freedom, or were you able to? Steven escapes okay. uh, he gets back to New York and he's able to tell his story. Uh, okay. And Robert, uh, I lose him in Arkansas. I don't know what happens to him. Mm. Okay. I don't know that he ever made it back. Right. Now, of course, the odd thing when you think about this is like, we all talk about Northrop's story, 12 Years a Slave. 
but these other people never write about their experience. They never publish that. Like, I guess, how common was it? How common was it that a black person gets kidnapped and ens enslaved? You know, it's it's one of those things that is impossible to quantify because when it worked, we're never going to know. That's uh, true, right? Because you put somebody in a contract and you sell them and yeah. it's got it, and when you look at that contract on its own, it just looks like everyday yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, the contract that makes that that you know facilitates the sale of Isaac and Robert and Stephen, it just mm -hmm. looks like any other contract. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. at that level, it's really difficult to know. Um, and then as far as like people being kidnapped in northern states and brought southward, we know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, we know uh, about, you know, people who were able to escape and tell their story or people whose families like worked to publicize that they were taken and mm -hmm. to try and get them back and organizations that did the same right. kind of work. Right. But it's impossible to quantify, yeah. uh, which is also scary. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. It's I mean you're you're a free person and all of a sudden you're in, you're enslaved on on a plantation in Mississippi, right? Like and and you have no recourse, right? No. Because you can't go to court and sue for your freedom. No. Like, and it was very difficult to do it. So Yeah. Like I mean you can't even testify on your own behalf. No. Yeah. So so <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but how lucky was Wright that he found planters that were willing to listen to him and actually take and, and investigate? Uh, tremendously lucky, because I think we see in Wright's story that, you know, there are moments where he tells his story and as a result, he sold and he mm -hmm. sold again. Right. Uh, right. And, um, I, I think the impulse for some of these planners was, you know, it's not my problem and I'm going to get mm -hmm. my money back one way or the other. Right. Uh, yeah. So he's lucky that he found someone willing to send a letter. He's mm -hmm. lucky that he was able to write a letter himself mm -hmm. um, and like tell people exactly where he was. Right. He's lucky that his uh, enslaver goes out of town and he's able to just walk out uh, when he does. Um if he had stayed, who knows how off, how much more this cycle would have reproduced itself. Right, right, of, uh, of course, right. Like, or, or he never got his freedom. Right, he would have been sold on and on and on until he is disappearing, like the other fellow in in Arkansas, and you just lose track of some eventually. And, and so, so, a good he got his freedom back. But then B, he got really the short end here. Like, yeah, he got freedom, but what does his owner do? He turns around and sues the guy that sold him and is like, no, 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 you sold me a, a free person. And right. that's how you how you find his how you found him, right? Yes. Yeah. Freedom uh sort of becomes a defect that they're willing to sue over. Uh, because that's how they get their money back. So uh, it, did he sue because he ran away or because it was a free person that was sold to him? Because it, he was a free person who was sold okay. to him. Right, yeah. so... so the case rests on him being able to prove that Wright was free. Okay. And you have Wright testifying. You have his mother testifying. Mm -hmm. You have all sorts of people lining up to tell this story. Right. Which in, in his case, I guess, was pretty easy to do, but. I guess in other cases that can be difficult if you like, may have not have no papers or something. Then how do you how do you show that you're a free person? Yeah, it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, but this is sort of where I was going with the like like the pervertedness, right? Like, so Wright spends years as a as an enslaved person laboring for these planters, and at the end he gets his freedom back, which he had before. He's he's not really getting anything that he hadn't had. He's like, restored to what he was supposed to always have, and the planter who bought him gets money. Yeah, right. He gets compensated for 
like the wrong wrongful sale yes yeah it's um and and there's you know all those other men in that chain of sales who also got to keep their money right. uh, so there's a lot of people who profited off his enslavement even after they recognized that he's free yeah yeah no, it, it's totally perverted in in that of like the but i mean like I guess that's always how it was that planters got their money and the enslaved didn't get anything. Years of service, servitude, unfortunately. So <clears throat> let's see, we have Wright, then we have, I gotta say, Jack Smith. <laughs> For some reason, I'm thinking now about like, um, Smith, the lawyer in the Trump case. <laughs> <laughs> but Smith is, I guess, an oddball, right? Because in this case, the, mass, the enslaver is, is going to lose the case. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, in most of the other cases, you don't have that. You're kind of looking at victorious cases of the and slavery actually getting money and the sale being overturned. So what happened with Jack? Um, so Jack is the subject of one of those warranty disputes, those retribution suits. Jack is sold to a sugar and cotton planter in Louisiana in uh, 1853. And by the end of the year, this planter, um, realizes that Jack is too sick to work from tuberculosis. So mm -hmm. he sues the seller, the slave trader named William Talbot for redhibition to cancel the sale, to mm -hmm. take Jack back, to give him his money back. Um, and to win that lawsuit, this enslaver, his name was Alfred Williams. You have, he had to prove that J Jack was sick before the sale Mm -hmm. securably sick before the sale um that that illness uh could not have been perceptible at the moment of sale so mm -hmm. he could have been expected to identify it when he purchased right. it and the third thing is that uh as an enslaver he did not contribute to the illness getting worse mm. on the <laughs> So he has to build this case that stretches into Jack's past um, and into Jack's present uh, in that on that plantation in Louisiana and proves those three things. So you have so Jack can't testify because he's an enslaved person, even though he knows himself and his health and his history better than anybody who talks about it. Ironic. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you have uh, these witnesses who testify uh, as to when they first met Jack, uh, as to when they witnessed him cough, and mm -hmm. how when they witnessed him be too sick to work, and things like that. And it ends up being this 10-year sort of window into uh, Jack Smith's declining health. Um, but the point... I try to make in the chapter is not just uh, let me summarize all these people's stories for you. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I, I think about how Alfred Williams and his attorney were able to build their history of Jack Smith. Mm -hmm. and what paper materials would they have had to go off of when mm -hmm. they were trying to historicize this person? And, you know, they they run into the same archival walls that we run into. Mm -hmm. They run into a contract that leads them to a seller mm -hmm. who's not invested in telling them a damn thing. And that's it. Um, so I argue that faced with these barriers, um, the what they did was interrogate Jack mm -hmm. about himself, about his past, about his health about free people who had borne witness to his his illness. Um, and that leads them to witnesses in Missouri and California who are who who do testify um, 
you know, about specific moments in Jack Smith's history um, that I argue the attorney involved wouldn't have known what to ask without Jack. Uh, so uh, when you look at the production of this lawsuit, you're left with a process that he must have played an active role in. Mm -hmm. And and that's sort of like, uh, as you were talking, I, like, I wanted to ask a different question first, but I kind of want to go with the California thing, because this is a crazy part, right? The, the, these court cases, they're not all about Louisiana. They they involve people from across the country. And I, I, I guess sort of the, the crazy part here is, so I sent a letter over to the Justice of Peace in California and asked them, can you interview this witness for us, or to, I guess the proper terminology here, would take a de deposition from a witness it that might know this enslaved person called Jack, yeah, from ten years ago. That that just seems crazy. Of like, we might remember like what five of the students that we had our first semester teaching, right? But yeah. we don't remember everyone. Like, yeah. if if I get a letter today from a student I had ten years ago, I might be able to remember a little about. This. How would a person remember, like, especially when, when we talk about slave and slave people? Yeah, I'm with you. Um, the way that I think um, these, these, because Jack was actually physically taken to Missouri to sit in court that way when the attorney asked, how do you know that the person you're talking about is the mm -hmm. same person at the center of the lawsuit. They could point him out in court and say, he's right there. Mm -hmm. I know it's him. Um, and, you know, he's not just the physical presence in court. He's a person subject to another interrogation outside of the courtroom mm -hmm. where these witnesses encounter him mm -hmm. and he has to perform mm -hmm. and he has to divulge information about these moments where they saw him cough and they saw him mm -hmm. be unable to work. Um, and we know that that, the, that interrogation happened because when witnesses are testifying, they describe it. Right. And they say, I wouldn't have recognized him if he hadn't known such intimate details about me and my family. And mm. then I recognized him. Oh, yeah. So even though Jack can't speak in the courtroom, you know, his speech and his memory and his mm. history are essential to mm -hmm. what happens. Right. And, you know, that's and mapping out that process and not arguing and acknowledging that he had to be interrogated for all this to happen. Um, that's the only way we're able to put him at the center of the story. Uh, it's not by summarizing everything that everybody said. It's by looking at the production of the information. Mm -hmm. And then we get back. Well, and that's sort of like. Right, you, you so his enslaver takes him to Missouri to get a to get depositions, mm -hmm. and I, 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 it's been a few days since I read it. So, I, I think you said that he claimed that he was well treated on the journey, but you kind of say I, I, it's very doubtful, and that it actually made his condition worse. Yeah. Um... There's a historian by the name of Thomas Buchanan who's done a lot of work to reconstruct what it was like to be on a steamboat on the Mississippi in the antebellum period. And he tells us that enslaved people were usually confined to the deck of the ship. Mm -hmm. They weren't inside. They weren't <laughs> sheltered from the elements. He was probably exposed in that way. Yeah. Uh, it's very unlikely that he was you know, kept dry. Right. And if you have, ex exactly, and if you have tuberculosis, wet conditions outside, that only makes it worse. So, yeah. like, it, it's almost like you're bringing a lawsuit because you want money back because your slave is in a bad condition, but you're in the process of the lawsuit killing your slave. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, yeah. he's not valuable to you in yeah. any other yeah, it, it, it's like a piece of, uh, it's almost like a law book you're carrying around, <laughs> or a piece of evidence. And, uh, but that was the, I think it was the, last, the third part that you mentioned with regards to the 
enslaver contributing in some form to the condition or causing the condition themselves. Yeah, that's that's what costs um, Jackson slaver the lawsuit. It's not that it's not even that he took him to Missouri. It's that uh, uh, they're a, they're able to discover in the course of interrogating these four doctors who mm -hmm. each saw Jack at different times that um, that the enslaver did not call a doctor when mm. Jack first fell ill. So the court decides that um, had you called the physician right when the illness presented itself, you might have been able to exploit him for longer. They don't contest that he's ill or any mm -hmm. of that. It's you didn't do a good enough job as an right. enslaver here. Right. Sort of negligence on your part. and <laughs> I bet he was very upset about that, said he. Like, bro, it gotta have cost him like a, a lot of money to travel all the way to Missouri with an enslaved person and back, and trying to get all these depositions plus legal costs and everything. And then court says, oh, "You're negligent." That was it. Mm -hmm. I guess Jack got justice in that a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Um, he was sick and he was dying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I uh, I I had this this moment in the book where I decide to be a little bit hopeful. Mm -hmm. Say that if we're gonna think about his experience at the center of this lawsuit, yeah. we can also choose to hopefully imagine that maybe when he went back to Missouri, he got to see some people that he loved. Mm -hmm. uh, like old family friends yeah so mm -hmm. i i hope he got something out of that yeah yeah kind of closure on some level right yeah mm. now comes a crazy one mm -hmm. right betsy into rachel so and, and i love how you just called the the chapter transforming betsy into rachel so it Again, it's sort of the the mystery story, the kind of the detective stories that you're asking people to like, oh, this is an interesting title. What is that about? So how do you turn one person into another person? Yeah, you um you find someone who's vulnerable, who doesn't have the evidence or the network necessary to prove that they are who they say they are mm -hmm. uh and then you put them in jail um yeah. and it was well within the authority of free people in louisiana to arrest people of color as runaway enslaved people mm -hmm. um and that's how betsy gets ensnared of this process of sale after sale is uh you know someone points her out mm -hmm. and she's arrested and she doesn't have papers mm -hmm. and she can't prove she is who she says she is. Uh, and it's this, um, this horror story of yeah. just knowing that what's happening is wrong and w the name that everyone's calling you is incorrect mm -hmm. and not being able to do anything about it. Right. And I assume she is not allowed to testify in her own, on her own behalf either. Because... No, uh, free people uh, in the freedom suits that I looked at. There aren't none of the plaintiffs testify on their own behalf. The way you, the way you get a glimpse of them and their story, is in the petitions, mm, where the okay. attorney explains this is who they are. This is why they're entitled to their freedom. Mm -hmm. With again, with information that could only have come from the enslaved person, but they don't get to testify on their own behalf. Yeah. I, I guess what, what, what would have been the preponderance of evidence needed? Like what, what would they have, like, would even have been a freedom paper been sufficient? Like would or like, like would have been like, like, I think you had the people that were like, yeah, she lived here, but, and we always thought that was her name, but 
that wasn't enough. So yeah. what what was needed? Like what what would have been the crucial smoking gun piece of evidence using a court case research, like hopefully coming like what's the box in the bathroom of documents we would have needed here? Yeah, the the kind of freedom suit that Betsy filed because not every, not all freedom suits are the same. Mm -hmm. Some people sue and say my enslaver took me with their consent to a state where slavery is illegal. I'm free. Uh, the enslaver put it in their will that I'm supposed to be free at the at, after their death. I'm mm -hmm. free. Uh, so every claim is different. And the standards of evidence differ based on the claim. But for Betsy, whose argument is, I was born free, mm -hmm. you have to prove that you were born free. Right. So you have to be able to present a <laughs> testimony or right. written evidence that says you were born to free parents and probably mm -hmm. in a free state, uh, mm -hmm. in Betsy's case, Ohio. Um, so... And she comes so close mm -hmm. and it just doesn't happen. Uh, she gets an, a person who was her neighbor in Ohio when she was a girl and is her neighbor now in New Orleans. Somehow. Coincident. Uh, yeah. To say, uh, I knew her when she was five years old, right. but five years old is not the moment of someone's birth. Right. So right. on that technicality, they right. decide right. she's Rachel. Which, again, it's, it, it's incredible. Like, would that be in the census? Like, you, could you track it down today and be like, her parents were free and therefore she sh would have been free? Um, I wasn't able to find any census data that, mm. that gave me insight into that. But, mm. um, you know, it, it's, it was hard to prove then and it's hard to prove now. Right, yeah. Um, God, and like I mean, in in Wright's case, at least there were family and people that like could work on your behalf. But like, she has nothing. Like she, she no. has friends who can say, "Yeah, I knew her as a girl." But and we don't have like this. Is probably important for our listeners. Like, there's no birth records are really hard to come by. Like, yeah, no birth certificates. Nothing. Yeah. Like like there's there's nothing <laughs> like today you go to the state of georgia and they're like hey i you know, kid got born in the state sent me a birth certificate you don't have that ability yet yeah. and you yeah, good god yeah terrifying yeah and he said earlier that you you might have something where you might want to track down and see if you can find her right yeah i uh because all those uh, notarial index are indexes are digitized in OCR now. They're text searchable, mm -hmm. so um, I'm gonna go back and look for her enslaver mm -hmm. uh, and see if he notarized any contracts after the lawsuit. Maybe see if mm -hmm. I can track her that way right. and mm -hmm. figure out what happened to her. That would be interesting. Hopefully, you can find her. Yeah. On the other hand, I, I suppose you, just kind of tangent here, you still looked through the the microfilm version. or like, <laughs> yeah. how, how does it feel that like now the book's <laughs> out and you're looking at like, oh, come on, now it's all digitized. <laughs> how easy would it have been? Yeah, that would have been, it would have been nice 10 years ago, but <laughs> it's okay. It's available now and, you know, uh, I, I hope that scholars take advantage of it. Uh, I'm certainly going to try to. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you, you take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It can be a bit frustrating when you go with the time and you're like, oh, I just got finished and now you're putting it online. Yep. <laughs> uh, and we save best for last, I suppose. Sarah Connor. Yeah. I, I didn't keep count. How many, how many lawsuits does this woman bring? Oh, I think it's like 12 or 13, something like that. 13. Yeah, quite a few. All right. And give us a cliff notes of like what 
what lawsuits did she bring? Like, because I, it, it's almost difficult to keep track of all the lawsuits yeah. and they're so varied. Yeah, in my in my dissertation, I had an appendix where I made a timeline <laughs> because you had to just to keep track of everything. Uh, but Sarah Connor was an enslaved woman in New Orleans. Well, she's born in Fairfax, Virginia, and she sold south to New Orleans by the time she's 18 or 20. And uh, she, by 1838, she's the property of this white woman named Jane Shelton. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhere between 1838 and 1841, Sarah Connor develops this relationship with a slave trader whose name might be familiar because he's um, he's uh, one of the men who sold Solomon Northup hmm. uh, and, and is described in 12 Years a Slave. Um, but his name was Theophilus Freeman. So he and Sarah Connor develop a romantic relationship and uh, she convinces, she eventually saves up enough money to uh, to sort of purchase herself. Um, yeah, we'll get so, to that in a, in a little bit. Yeah. Like. Uh, Jane Shelton, who owns her, sells her to Theophilus Freeman for $700 of Sarah's money. And then Freeman sort of never claims her as his slave, and she lives as a free woman from mm -hmm. then. Um, but, you know, Freeman... Who, they lived together for like a decade. Um, Freeman gets, you know, over his head in debt and his creditors start coming for him. And when his creditors start coming for him, they also start coming for Sarah uh, with the understanding that one, she's still his enslaved property. So she should be subject to seizure and sale mm -hmm. to compensate for his debts. Uh, and two, they also think that he's hiding money and assets in her name. Um, so they, they come, they arrest Sarah, they arrest enslaved people who see, she says she has purchased, uh, and that are hers. So when she gets out of jail, she starts filing lawsuits against Freeman's creditors saying, uh, you took my enslaved property and I want them back. Uh, and these lawsuits play out over a lengthy period of time. Mm -hmm. And there are countersuits where she's accused of still being an enslaved person, where she loses in court and is reverted to being an enslaved person. And then eventually the Louisiana Supreme Court appeals it, but that could not have been, you know, a pleasant experience. Uh, I'm sure it was scary. Um, so, the, uh, because she generated, you know, a tremendous amount of sources in the form of like court records, but also newspaper accounts and mm. contracts and things like that. You can, you can tell a very long story about Sarah Connor in a way that you can't about every other person in the book. Okay. First thing, how did you find her? Oh, she, um, so I found her because when I finished combing through all those lawsuits and I had all my data, I went back to Houston and my advisor said, go read soul by soul again. You've seen everything he's seen. Now right. see what you think. So yeah. I read it again and there's, there's this line in soul by soul where Johnson says, the office Freeman was in the habit of taking meetings in bed with his enslaved concubine, Sarah Connor. Oh. Uh, and he moves on. And so when I read it again, um, I thought, how would you know that? Right. Uh, so go to the footnotes and it leads you to a Louisiana Supreme Court appeal, which leads you to 12 more <laughs> Louisiana Supreme Court appeals. And it was just like pulling a thread that wouldn't end. Right. Yeah. I kind of was wondering because it's sort of like, it's sort of like, oh, Sarah Connor. I heard her before. I'm like, oh, there's Sarah Connor again. There's Sarah Connor. Like, sort of like this moment, right, of like the dominoes falling of like, she's there. Yeah. She's, all, she's all over the place. What's going on here, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
yeah, so like in UK, I think it's threads that you just start pulling and it just unravels. <laughs> um, yeah, so like it just so such a crazy story, right? Of like, uh, so was she free? Was she not free? Like, 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 what's the relationship between her and Freeman? You know, um, based on you know, after that sale that she negotiates, she lives like a free person. She buys and sells enslaved people. She runs her own business. She travels to states where slavery is illegal and she willingly comes back. She believes she's free. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually she sues Freeman for her freedom on paper. Mm. Um, not because he's actively enslaving her, but because his creditors are coming for her. And she wants, she says in her petition, I want uh, proof upon the records of the country that I am a free person. Right. Uh, she wants evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and after she wins that lawsuit, you know, uh, there's a historian by the name of John Bardis who tells us that this was not the case, that once you were granted freedom, it could never be taken away from you. But uh, on paper, once that lawsuit, when she wins that lawsuit, she's supposed to be free and that's supposed to be it. But it's not the end of the story. Right. No, and that's the crazy part, right? Of like, uh, that you then have cases where creditors trying to defend Spend properties that they have taken, try to do, turn her into property so that they can keep enslaved property. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Her freedom is very threatened. Yeah. And it, and it seems like very little respect as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's vulnerable. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know that there's another word for it. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And and what's the relationship between Connor and Friedman? Are they like are they a couple? Are they just like yeah. they they enjoy they, each other's company? Like so, they were a couple. Um, everyone who testifies in those lawsuits calls them a couple. Um, mm -hmm. Says that they were together. Mm -hmm. um, they lived together for about a decade. Um, they they were partners uh, but because you know the circumstances around people talking about their relationship is lawsuits mm -hmm. like they don't talk about their relationship so right. I have I have no insight into like how they met and the circumstances yeah. surrounding that meeting yeah. um, how their relationship started and grew I, I don't know there are a million questions that I have yeah, I mean, I, I, the other one is like, how did she make money that she can claim she owned all these enslaved people too? <laughs> yeah, she um, she furnished and rented out rooms. And there's a historian who also wrote about Sarah Connor in, in her very good book. Her name's Alex Finley. And uh, she says that there's, um, that the way that Sarah is described in, uh, by, the white woman who owned her suggests that she may have been a sex worker. Um, okay. And, and she may have purchased enslaved women for that purpose explicitly, okay. but we, we don't know that for sure. Right. And that would potentially turn her into something of a pimp and Freeman as Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, yeah. that, that would be a rabbit hole to go down on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard to like, parse out that part of her life yeah well yeah and and it's it's hard because it, like you show throughout the book we have very little evidence for a lot of these things like we have to infer so much about these issues that yeah. it, it, what would be nice but <laughs> we can't bring him back and ask him a question or like, no unfortunately we can't yeah. um but what I also found interesting about Connor was how I want to say you had a case where she's trying to kind of sue for the freedom of 
slave enslaved people she owned, but then decides that she's just gonna buy them instead of. Oh, or was uh, that? No. To, to my knowledge, she never um, advocated for anyone else's freedom besides her own. Uh, no, no, no. I mean that she instead of like uh, these enslaved women were taken from her from Freeman, claiming yes. that it's her that it's his. Yeah, she claims that are they're hers, yes. and instead of fighting this in court, she just buys some a second time. Yeah, and she I, gives I, up on suing, and uh, she uh, gets her new partner, a man hmm. by the name of Smith Hazard, to buy the woman who was taken from her. So she goes hmm. back to enslaving her. So. Right. And it's important that she keeps enslaving. She does not. Like grand freedomizer, it's like it's, no, she doesn't. Like, there is, I guess, we could ask, like, was it all women that she owned, or was it women, man, children that she owned, or like... she owned at least one man named Peter because okay. she does sue over him, so I know that she owned him. And oh. now that I, I keep plugging those notarial records, but <laughs> now that those those records are to tech searchable like i've been able to find all the mm -hmm. material contracts that she wrote so oh now now i can learn a little bit more about her as an enslaver yeah right yeah. it would be fascinating to write a biography of her i, I assume it, records might be a little slim but cool. yeah you know um for a long time that's what i've been saying is going to be my second project uh because mm -hmm. you can follow her to you know she lives in new orleans till the 1880s and then she moves to washington right. dc and dies a very wealthy woman um uh so there's a lot of rich uh information there yeah absolutely yeah. well <laughs> that that would be very fascinating so in 10 years i'll have you back and <laughs> <laughs> ask you about that <laughs> uh, no, like as I said, Freeman was, or sorry, Connor was just, my God, this this woman is just, she just keeps fighting, she just yeah. doesn't give up. Like, which for an formerly enslaved person, that is incredible to yeah. kind of have that stamina to just keep going. Yeah, very much so. Um, so. As we're getting to, we are at the end of the book <laughs> at this stage. Uh, are there any, are there any characters you kind of would have liked to include, or were these five the ones that you were like, this is enough, or like, were you like, hmm, I could have done, I would have liked to do one or two more. Um. You know, I had these reading through all those lawsuits. Um, there are other people whose stories could have worked, mm -hmm. you know, instead of Jack Smith's or yeah. uh, even instead of Betsy's. Mm -hmm. uh, other people who found themselves up against, you know, a system that wasn't built to work for them. Uh so, uh, but, you know, no, nobody specific is coming mm -hmm. to mind, honestly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, it's curious because sometimes you have like this like fascinating person that you kind of are forced to cut out because it just, you don't have enough or. Actually, now that you said that there's, there's this one and it's, it's not even a red hibition suit or a freedom suit, but uh, she pops into my mind sometimes. It was a a free woman of color by the name of Pauline Foy. And she was the daughter of a previously enslaved woman and a white man uh, named Prosper Foy, who was like this wealthy jeweler in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And something happens, I don't know what, where he attempts to take possession of her and enslave her and maybe sell her. And Pauline's mother sues to get her back. Okay. Um, and I've I've always wanted to know like the circumstances surrounding that lawsuit. So 
uh, Prosper Foy has papers at Tulane. Oh, so okay. I poured through all those, and there's there's the the very last entry on the finding aid is Pauline Foy's notebook. Oh. And, and you go to the boxes, and you go to the last folder, and there's a notebook, and on the inside, it's got her signature. And then you've got like 20 pages that have just been ripped out. Uh, and the rest of it is just blank. Oh. It's a real I kick don't know about. Yeah. Uh, so I always wonder what those pages had that someone who donated these papers didn't want read. Like right. it, it just, uh, there's something there, but I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. God, that's so, um, that's so terrible. You can see like, it was there. Well, there was a story there, and somebody intentionally destroyed it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <sighs> and well, uh, book burning is still sort of a thing. And yeah. And this, I, I would assume they burn the pages, <laughs> and no one can get to them. So uh, there was something incriminating in them. I think so. Uh, it's, uh, we can't get to them. Hmm. All right, great. Um, I I think we got it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm trying to think of like another, like, but we we covered the whole book, and and from what I can see, um, and it it as I said, it's a fascinating study. I I like the style you had with the books. The kind of personalizing the stories, kind of trying to kind of change the change the perspective that was great um so it, it was really interesting thanks so much I, I, I hope there will be a lot of grad students reading it in in seminars in yeah. the next next couple of years yeah hopefully and it's it, i think that's the other part right what was it your decision that it's like it's it's only like what 120 pages and mm -hmm. it's a really nice slim volume that you could even give like to an undergraduate course yeah, I hope so. I I tried to write it so people who are just interested in history might be able to get something from it. And, you know, I got a grant to make it uh, permanently, like freely accessible. So if you don't oh, want to wow. spend the money to buy it, it's available on Project Muse. You can go download it. Uh, awesome. <laughs> that's totally cool, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that gives you more views of the book now. Yeah. I guess it it eliminates the royalty check, I suppose, but yeah. It, yeah. it it gets you more readership. So and yeah, and I right. think the other part there is that it, it can serve as a great sort of research methodology tool of like how do you how do you change the narrative? Where do you look for information? How do you turn that information into something different? Right? That mm -hmm. like that's the other part where it's sort of nicely useful in, in sort of as a classroom. I hope so. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Throwing out ideas for people. <laughs> well, um, was that Zan Maria? Thank you so much for for joining me tonight or today here. It's still daytime in in Atlanta. You still have a few hours. Yes. A few hours left. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a few more Democratic convention speakers to go through <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before That's the right. end of the day. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's a great book. If you are interested, let me get the title here again. It's Enslaved Archives, Slavery, Law, and the Production of the Past. And as Maria just said, if you go to the Johns Hopkins University Press website, there is a link to that I just now realize is there to read the book for free on Project Muse. All right. It was a pleasure, Maria. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it very much.